party. Uh, hello, uh, I'm, I'm Theo Schlossnagel, um, and I'm giving the, the big bad PostgreSQL talk. Uh, kind, of, kind of hard to say big bad while on Facebook, but we'll do that. Um, so this is about a, a large, complicated, mission-critical data warehouse. Um, of course, large and complicated are all relative terms. Um, it sounds equally as complicated as to what was just described, but not nearly as large. Um, so it, it, it was an Oracle, and uh, it was running too slow and too small, and uh, the licensing costs uh, were crazy to go forward. So we, we uh, decided to go down the Postgres route. So I'll talk about why, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges we faced and um, how we got around that, and then. Um, how we managed to embrace operating system features to make our database kick a little more ass, and how you can adapt um, that to MySQL and Oracle as well. So if you're a little bit creative, you can take what we've done um, using Solaris uh, under the hood and actually make <coughs> MySQL a lot better as well. So here we go. So this is the, uh, the overall architecture of what we were looking at. Um, it's a pretty straightforward system. It was a, it's a large top 100 website, and they have an OLTP instance that's in Oracle. Um, they have SQL code littered through pretty much everything that was ever developed by any web developer. And the idea of switching that to another database was probably about two years worth of redevelopment work. Um, it wasn't stored proc based or anything like that. So the idea of changing the OLTP instance from Oracle was to anything was pretty ridiculous. Um, we played with Enterprise DB a little bit. Um, that wasn't. We decided not to go that way either. Um, so at the center, at the center of everything, that we had a data warehouse. That was running on Oracle 8i. It had about two terabytes of uh, data in it, and um, it was slow. It was on like a E450, 400 megahertz processors. It's actually quite amazing what you can do with 400 megahertz processors in Oracle. It's a pretty solid app. Um, however, we needed to get bigger than that. Run some more jobs. Um, and we had a lot of other databases in there, a lot of MySQL databases, some other Postgres databases, some stuff in SQLite. It's kind of a big collage of, of database technologies. So the problems were that we had the database growing. Um, they were too slow. There's a lot of application code against the OLTP, but there wasn't that much application code against the data warehouse. Really, it's a warehouse. It has a lot of data in it. There's a lot of putting data in it. There's a lot of jobs that run against it, but like, um, people were just running, writing custom SQL against it to get business intelligence information out. So retraining people is easier than writing a mo rewriting a million lines of Perl code. Um, so like Oracle, I don't have to tell everybody, that's expensive. Uh, they were also not very forgiving in any sort of negotiation to say, hey, that's too expensive. So it didn't go anywhere. So Postgres, no licensing cost. And the upside was that it had really good support for complex queries. And when I say complex queries, I'm talking about ta uh, queries with, with three or four subselects across tables with billions of rows in them. So I want every user that ever clicked on this, that didn't click on that, that, that registered between 1997 and 1999, that had blue eyes. And you end up having to touch enough tables where you're actually doing some, some, some subqueries against tables that produce you know, 500 million result rows. And if you don't have a really good optimizer and a planner, or a planner and an optimizer, then um, you kind of run into that problem. I don't know, we've seen that before with MySQL where you run a query and it like, takes like 15 minutes and you're like, is this still what I wanted to do? And then you kind of plan it, try to decipher it and you go, and that would take like 400 years to run. So what am I gonna do now? And then you end up create, taking your sub queries and creating tables on those and then indexing them as temp tables and then rewriting your queries and like asking somebody who just knows SQL to, you know because they're used to using Oracle and they go why don't I just hint the subquery and you go well it doesn't work that way learn some Perl um, that doesn't work right you have to retrain too much staff so the idea of going to Postgres was pretty easy because people could write same queries and you'd have a chance at the front pass. so um, we needed more processors in OLTP, so by decommissioning our data warehouse in Oracle, we got to shift the licenses. That was great. Um, Oracle not required, needed more space. So we ran Postgres. So Postgres gotchas. Um, I don't know, how many people here are familiar with Postgres technology? Pretty good amount, all right. But it, has, um, it uses this approach called NVCC. Um, which leaves these dead rows around for old transactions. So as you're, so in Oracle, when you're when you're writing new data and rewriting new rows, basically it pushes all the junk to roll it back into a rollback segment, 
and it assumes kind of, which is kind of a good model that you're going to commit, and you kind of lose that stuff, and that's fine. In Postgres, all of the data for transactions, like if I delete a piece of data for Postgres, the row is just marked as not visible anymore by future transactions. So the row is still there, which is really problematic if you have a lot of row churn. So a day later, when you've replaced every row in your table, your table's at least twice the size because you have all these rows that nobody can see anymore. Not, not ideal. So in Oracle, people always say, I don't have to pay for that in Oracle. In Oracle, you amortize that. Every time you do something, it's a little bit more expensive and you don't ever pay for it at the end. In, uh, in Postgres and other systems using ECC, you end up vacuuming, which is just you run through the table and clean out dead tuples and things like that. It sucks. Um, Postgres has done some things to make it better, but it's still bad. The other killer is that um, previous to uh, Postgres 8.3, there was no way to upgrade Postgres. So, no excuses for that. That sucks. Not worth a couple hundred thousand bucks, but it certainly sucks. Um, there's a lot less experience with large databases in Postgres. So that's one of the biggest problems that, that we found is like, okay, so I need to throw a couple of terabytes into Postgres. Who do I talk to? You end up talking to a couple of commercial vendors that don't want to sell you Postgres, they want to sell you their version. Um, but the idea of dumping on you know, a community channel, going to a conference and saying, who else has 10 billion rows in their table? Like, you can find MySQL users all the time that have that much data. It's not a problem. Of course, they're not actually asking a lot of really complicated questions of their data. So it's kind of a mix. Um, the replication features are less evolved. However, we found that uh, with a little bit of uh, elbow grease, we were able to accomplish replication features that we couldn't accomplish in other databases, mainly due to the integration of um, uh, the procedural languages of Postgres. You can do Python and Perl and things like that. So we're able to connect out to other databases and pull stuff. However, Postgres, a lot of those disadvantages, they don't really come to light in an ODS. ODS, operational data store, you're storing stuff. Like most of the time, you're just inserting data, not really deleting, you're not really updating that much. So the idea of having to vacuum your tables, if I have people who are clicking on web pages and I'm tracking that behavior, I put it in a table, next year, I'm not gonna update that information It happened kind of set in stone. So the idea that you're writing stone tablets all the time is really good for MVCC. Um, they're really controlled inserts, uh, updates and deletes, not real time. PL Perl, we can leverage the DBI layer uh, in Perl, so I can connect to just about any database on the planet, and it's very easy with a common API. And it really supports monster query as well. It's really, it has one of the better planners of, of databases. I wouldn't say it's as good as Oracle's, but I would say it opens its kimono a little bit more, and you can see what it's doing a little better. Um, and it's extensible. So, so we chose Linux. Um, it's awesome, it has good computer support. If you jump on IRC and you say, hey, I want to run Postgres, what should I run it on? They say Linux, it's great. So we had kernel panics all the time um, with, maybe it was a hardware configuration, but um, we ran Linux on that box for years beforehand, um, and then we switched it over to run Postgres, and it was unhappy. Um, we had the file system periodically remounting itself, read-only, which was very unuseful. Um, and I asked questions, and some guys at uh, Yahoo and Flickr were like, God, I see that all the time. We reboot. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's great. What's what my system like? Um, we tried ext3, and we tried XFS, and they both had that problem. Uh, that was CentOS 4, at the time CentOS 4.3, so, or Red Hat and Enterprise Linux 4. When did it start this whole XFS? This was started in uh, 2007, January 2007? No, January 2006. So um, we gave Linux about nine months, so around August of 2006 we did something else. Um, one of the biggest problems we had, though, was that it didn't support snapshots. So, like, the idea of Postgres also has really crappy backups. Not nearly as bad as MySQL. But the idea that um, that you can't really logically dump the database without taking locks out on all the tables. Because uh, basically there's there's a logical export from the database, which is a lot like MySQL dump. It's called PG dump, creatively. Um, so it dumps everything logically out. You can PG restore and rebuild all your tables logically. The upside of Postgres is that you can, just like Oracle, instead of Oracle, alter database uh, backup. And Post in Postgres, you say, select PG start backup. And boom, you can back up a whole file system. You can do it a little lazy. And you know you have a consistent good backup. And then you say PG stop backup. And then things start to, 
to go again. Of course, the whole database is going that whole time. It just checkpoints and manages archive wall, uh, the wall files and everything like that. Um, but file system snapshots really help because you can you can reduce that window. And what about the LVM? So LVM, LVM has all sorts of interesting issues. Um, there's an article that just came out that they found the semantics of F-Sync weren't right on LVM, which mean that anything that was put on LVM had really bad data integrity risks. So didn't know that beforehand, but now I'm glad I'm not on it. Um, we spent a very quick week taking all of our clients off of LVM when we found that out, because um, the idea of data integrity problems on a database you put all your BI information in is probably pretty bad. Um, one of the biggest problems with LVM is that your file system has to support being remounted. Um, so XFS supports that really well, and ext 3 supports that, but the other ones don't. Um, so if you're running ext 3 or XFS, you can uh, snapshot LVM and then mount the read-only do back up there. The downside that we found is you can't clone those snapshots. So say I want to take that snapshot and start writing to it, and then throw away my changes. So uh, well, actually, redirect some redirect snapshots that are in LVM too. Are they in LVM too? Yeah, LVM too. And uh, that should be actually uh, sent to us uh, for the three LVM two based. We had problems with that. We 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 well, couldn't uh, get that well, but I mean seriously, okay. yeah. Uh, uh, four the uh, sent to us four had some issues with yeah. LVM. Uh, uh, five is much better. In terms right. of LVM. So and. Um, one of the things we found LVM really clunky, it, it, it was very much like Veritas, which is an awesome product because it works all the time as expected, but it's also very clunky the way that it works. If you're on an enterprise storage, why, why don't you use snapshot in there? If you're on enterprise storage, the question is, if you're on enterprise storage, why don't you use snapshot, snapshotting there? So on that diagram, you can see we were on two different storage arrays by two different vendors which makes it a little bit more tricky. Um, if you have like snapshots on your NetApp or snapshots on your Hitachi, then you should use them because they charged you way too much money for it, so you better use them. <laughs> so um, enterprises, we're running this on commodity hardware with enterprise storage, so something at some point has to break and you start have to running it on commodity hardware with commodity storage. That's what LVM is supposed to give you, right? It gives you great enterprise storage features on commodity hardware. It doesn't really. Um, so 20 outages in four months. One of the big problems we had is we had a hardware bug in our RAID controller. And it wrote crap out all over the drives. And we didn't know because we kept reading the data back and LVM was like, here's your data. It's not what you expect, but here's your data. Um, you can always say, hey, you can't avoid hardware failures because they happen. But it's nice when your file system can protect you from that. So we switched to Solaris 10. Um, we never had any crashes. Um, we had some processor and, uh, failures. Some, some question about that. Don't you have like checksums on the pages in Postgres? You have checksums on the pages in Postgres. Okay. That's right. So when you get them back, the the Postgres application can know okay. that. Um, well, some pages have checksums. Yeah, some well, do not. Okay, I see. Because right. in in a DB, we get you know checksum error. Your hardware is a crap. Go fix your hardware. Oh, so, so that's exactly how ZFS works. It gets a checksum back and says your hardware is crap. But I have a ditto copy of that that I will oh. hopefully replace, which is really nice. So the question is whether you build that into Postgres, which is good. It would be great. But then if I build it into my file system, I get it for every app, which is nice. Um, is there no option to run Postgres directly on raw storage? There is no option to run Postgres on raw storage. So um, one of the nice things, and I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about this with BLI, the block level incremental backups. So we have, we have a lot, we have two terabytes, three terabytes of data now on there, and we need to back it up. So the idea, I need daily backups. The idea of backing up three terabytes of data is really unfortunate, um, just because the box is busy. It's reading a lot of that data already to service queries. I don't want to have to go read it all to move it to tape. I do that once a week. But every day I have like maybe 60 gigs, 90 gigs of churn, and I only want to back up the changes. Um, so one of the things that w we did on, uh, on our Oracle database is we ran the Veritas uh, file system. And you can integrate that with your backup tools, whether it's Legato or Veritas Net Backup. And it basically does block level incremental scans. So I snapshot the file system and back up the whole snapshot. Tomorrow I snapshot the file systems, but when I back it up, it says, I'm only backing up the blocks that are different between this snapshot and that snapshot, which is cheap. Um, ZFS gives you that for free. You can just send the incremental snapshot to backup. 
Um, has really good support for enterprise storage and actually turns commodity storage into enterprise storage pretty much. And D-Trace, which actually opened our eyes to a lot of performance issues that we had that, that we didn't know we had or didn't understand. S3, just like Linux. So, what did we need in Oracle? We needed partitioning, we needed statistics and aggregation, things like rack, um, rank over partition, lead, lag, all the windowing functions. Um, we had large selects, select 100 gigs of data at least at a time. We needed autonomous transactions, the idea of being able to be inside of a transaction and say, I want to insert into this table and commit that row inside of my transaction and then step back out. It's one of the cool features of, of Oracle. Um, replication from Oracle to Oracle is what we were doing. So, um, large data sets. So that has a lot of rows. Uh, that's like 2 billion. Um, I have another table that has over 10 billion. Um, so, it's a lot of stuff. So we're allowed to cluster that data. Um, and most of our scans are over specific ranges. Um, partitioning that stuff allows you to cheaply move stuff that you don't read often on slower storage, which is really nice. Um, we can put ranges uh, that are used less often on slow storage and try to keep the new ones we're inserting into on fast, expensive storage. Um, we found out that storage is cheap enough if you buy commodity storage that you just stop caring, which is anybody like the Hadoop guys and buy terabyte drives and just stop caring. When you have 600 machines, you, you do stop caring. When you have one, you care a little bit more. Um, so Postgres doesn't support partitioning. It supports inheritance. What's that? It's a cheap knockoff. Completely different if you want to use it for partitioning. It's a very cool paradigm that nobody really uses. So um, we use it to implement. Uh, we have one master with no rows and child's children that inherit from that and put our, our rows in that table. Um, I'm going to skip through this stuff pretty fast. Um, so we can add new partitions. We can cheaply e remove old partitions. And we can move those uh, older partitions onto slower storage if we know that they're read less often. So that's really useful. Um, we can have different indexing strategies on each partition because they're really their own table, which is nice. Um, and Postgres 8.1 and later support constraint checking. So if I do uh, select, you know, select this, how many users hit this um, page between this date and that date, if I put the, the dates in fixed form in the query, it'll go scan the constraints on the tables and avoid any tables that know it can't have. It, it knows that no data can be in, which is pretty useful. Smarter planning, smarter executing. So one of the big things that we found is rank over partition, which we use a lot of. Any sort of windowing function doesn't exist in Postgres. So we end up having this really cheap knockoff emulation in, in um, PLP SQL, which is awful. With 8.4, which we're not on yet, because it's not out yet, um, there are windowing functions. So a lot of those pains will go away. But we've had to deal with it for three years now. So, so that's uh, a big query in its results set. It's just every row of data that comes out is about 2K. There's lots of users, probably 40, 50 million users. It's a lot of data that comes back. Postgres is really, really stupid um, with its client libraries and actually says, oh, I have 2K of data times 100,000 rows. I need to malloc all that data and pull it into memory before I give you a single row back, which is really dumb. Um, so you have to avoid that by using cursors and fetching. This is an awful thing in Postgres. Just it'll bite you if you don't do it. So we have to declare a cursor and then fetch on the cursor. So pretty standard database stuff. It's just not standard that you have to do it to succeed. Autonomous transactions. So we had um, over 2,000 Oracle store procedures in the old system that we had to convert into Postgres. Luckily, PLPGSQL and PLSQL are almost identical. So it was very easy to convert those. One of the things that we did in those store procedures is there was a lot of logging. Like, I'm starting a procedure. I'm, I'm about to start. I'm doing this step of my procedure. I'm doing that step of my procedure. That sounds really useful until an error happens and you roll back and all of your logging gets rolled back too. It's not very useful at all. So that's where the autonomous committing stuff works really well in Oracle because you can actually isolate some of your logging statements to be committed immediately and don't get affected by rollback. Um, Postgres does not have that and it is almost impossible to implement without hacking, which is we didn't want to hack the source code, so we, we did something stupid, uh, which was we actually used DBI, DBD to connect back to Postgres and start a new transaction, log, and then disconnect. 
Um, and as long as you're not logging that often, it works very, very well. Um, I think we, we had that in our O tools. Um, we have an open source project that has all of the tools that we build for, for doing this. Um, doesn't support it. Use brute force. Use PLPGSQL. Um, cross vendor database replication. Um, we use DVD, Oracle, and connect over to our Oracle database and do inserts. So we do both snapshots and we do DML logs. So on the Oracle side, if anybody's familiar with Oracle, um, the way it does materialized views and replication, basically it tracks the row level changes on a table and moves that over to another server. So um, with newer versions of Oracle, this is on Oracle 8i, newer versions of Oracle, you can use um, some of the Oracle tools to help you do that. Um, so what we did is emulate that because we didn't have access to that. Um, we just created triggers on the tables that track primary keys that change, and we siphon over the changes as they happen. So I'm going to skip quickly through this. Uh, new architecture, uh, we have Tucson V40s that are about 6 terabytes each um, doing the ODS, and we have two 14 terabyte boxes doing data store and business intelligence on email. So no upgrades, PGDOF is too, too intrusive, bad systems level instrumentation compared to Oracle. Like in Oracle, if you want to know what's going on with your Oracle instance, you simply ask and it tells as a database should. Um, MySQL and Postgres both are horrible in comparison to Oracle and the, and the visibility you have to what's going on under the hood. So um, we started to realize all the features that we had underneath us to help us out. So D-Trace allows you to uh, dynamically instrument anything. In fact, you can see deeper than Oracle can. You can actually see deeper in Oracle with D-Trace than Oracle can alone, um, which is very cool. Um, the ZFS stuff saved our bacon so many times. The idea that you can roll back your file system when your database doesn't work right. It's great. Um, and zones. So really quick, Zetaback file system. That's the Sun ZFS file system. Um, it's, it's huge. It's the next thing. It's, it's, it's basically the single largest innovation in file systems in the last probably 15 years. And given its features, there aren't too many extra features that you would want in a file system. There's a couple of file systems that are coming out that have really comparable features. They just don't have nine years of production use, which kind of puts them at a disadvantage. So ext 4 has got some cool stuff. BRTFS looks awesome nine years from now. I'll be as confident in it. Um, so ZFS has snapshots, rollbacks, clones, promotes. So basically, I can take a two terabyte volume, snapshot it, which takes a few seconds, so I have a, a fixed copy. I can clone that into its own file system, which takes another 64 kilobytes of space. And then I can mount it as a read-write database, play with it. I only touch, I only take the, uh, occupy space for the blocks I touch in write mode. And then when I'm done with it, I can throw it away. So the idea of bringing a clone online that doesn't have any of the uh, database level locking restrictions means that I can take a backup database, like a point in time slave, I can clone the file system, promote it, mount it up as a read-write database and do a PG dump against it, take all the locks I want because I have my own database that no one's touching, which is really slick. Um, ZFS is slower than other database, uh, other file systems, hands down. You should go into that expecting it. Um, zones, anybody use uh, Virtuoso OpenPC? I'll skip faster. All right, so uh, shared kernel, you can run multiple systems on the same system. Pretty much every uh, operating system has this feature now. Virtuoso, OpenBC, um, it's a little different than Zen, it's lighter weight. So on Linux, there's an awesome alternative to this, which is OpenBC. It's like FreeBSD jails. So with ZFS plus zones, exactly what I said, you can clone, uh, promote, and get basically entire copies of your 20 terabyte, 100 terabyte database up and running uh, without extra hardware. We had a bug in Postgres, crapped all over our data, tried to fix it. Um, by hacking on Postgres source code, uh, which is really dangerous because every time you hack and make a mistake, you eat your data further. Um, the idea of being able to snapshot my file system, trial and error, I don't have to restore from tape, I just roll back to the previous, the, the previous um, uh, disk image, which was great. Um, and D-Trace. So this, this will make everyone want to run MySQL on Solaris, because this isn't specific to, to uh, Postgres in any way, shape, or form. Dtrace basically allows you to check at any point in any code, any machine instruction, entry, exit of any function, any statically traced probe, 
inside the kernel, I.O. layer, fiber controller drivers, everything. It's like awk connected to that, which is as sick as it sounds, it's very cool. So the idea that I can put a trace probe when Postgres starts a statement and then ask the operating system that when it, when it plans a strategy to actually spin a disk head and connect those two in the same script and say, I started a query, I just finished my query, how many reads, writes that I did to each spindle, how far was my seek? You can do that in like 15 lines of, sh of script. Run it on the fly and watch your production database as that happens. And it's designed to be safe. So there are a whole bunch of, um, uh, there's lots of stuff in the Solaris kernel and now the FreeBSD kernel and Mac OS X. So anybody who's got a Mac OS X laptop, they can play with D-Traces too. So the idea that I can run these queries, watch people running queries and realize that I'm reading 16K off of SD1 and, and you know, I just read 71 megs off SD2 to satisfy those queries, which is really slick. You, you can see this in any database. It has nothing to do with databases. It's really more with D-Trace. Um, and you can build really slick tools with it. So you can see minimum, average, max, uh, milliseconds latency on each write, number of writes and reads to each table in your database. That's like 100 lines of Perl with D-Trace in it, and it just spits that out like top, which is very cool. So somebody should adapt that to MySQL, because that'd be really useful. That's it. We saved 500,000 bucks or more. 700,000 now. That's well done.